this pyramid is all designed to help the general public. You've kind of gone into this more molecular biology, you know, what well. does the venom do? But he's getting it. tired holding that. He goes Tell backwards, go. yeah, and he just banged against this. For this feeding here, we're yep. just going to use just some regular Gerber number two baby food. Uh -huh. We do this about every third or fourth feeding, uh, but the other feedings are a formula that have some calcium and some vionate and some Hills AD and a little bit of proportion. At stuff. this point, though, Jack, some I have to tell you, the people are wondering what the hell we're talking about. Hi, everyone. We're hanging out with my friend Jack Vicente. We are inside his beautiful, how do I say the agri agrotoxins? Agrotoxins. Yes. Agrotoxins. Yes. You guys know Jack. We haven't seen him in a couple of years. I thought we were inside. Central Florida, let's visit my buddy. Just got back from a cruise, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, enjoying yeah. retirement. Yes. Uh, but I love visiting Jack because we get to do some really cool stuff and we get to really see behind the curtain of venom production and what it entails. And so it's been a little while. Yeah. Uh, I know you got some new things going on. Right now, we're gonna feed some neonate coral snakes, right? Yeah, well, what we've got here is uh, we're, we're reaching the end of a two-year project where we took uh, two large adults, male okay. and female, of course, and bred them. Uh, we got 18 eggs out of that batch and we separated 10 uh, babies and we monitored their venom collection every quarter. Okay. Um, I'm working with Dr. Bill Hayes at Loma Linda and he has an interest to find out if uh, there's an ontogenetic change. In other words, does the venom change from the day they come out of the egg while they're neonates up until they reach adulthood? Ah, uh, interesting. So we, we already know that the adult venoms all throughout the eastern coral snake range is identical. That was... Uh, Very cool. Yeah. Because uh, that was something I learned from you last time. You could have have, uh, with rattlesnakes, for example, uh, you can have the same species rattlesnake from a different locale and the venom is actually different. There are geographical <laughs> variations in a lot of venoms that we even still don't know to this day. But that's that makes it difficult. Oh, it makes it. When uh, someone gets envenomated, yes. if you don't get the right antivenom, you may not, it may not work. E even more difficult than here in the United States. Uh, fortunately, our North American antivenom producers know this and they're looking at these changes geographically and they're adjusting their inoculation formulas. In other words, what do we do here? Uh, we primarily produce venom for anti-venom, and what that means, people come in here and say, oh, well, if I get bit, I'll come to you. No, the venom is taken from the snake in uh, a liquid form. Okay. It is then centrifuge, and then the, uh, the top part that's very pure is pulled off and is put on a machine called a freeze dryer. And what that does is it dehydrates it Turns while it's it frozen. It yeah. never thaws out. Wow. It goes from a frozen solid into a, 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 a dry powder. And it's sold by weight uh, milligrams as a powder. That product is shipped to the pharmaceutical company or the antivenom manufacturer. They take it and reconstitute it and they inject the, the raw venom into a host animal, usually a horse or a sheep, and they build up that animal's uh, antibody. They make it hyperimmune. Okay. This is not a vaccine where we're dealing with one molecule of, uh, you know, one, one piece of uh, a problem, uh, like, like the pandemic, like, right. like, like COVID. No, this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different proteins and toxins at the same time. That are time. all working in concert to yes, do something. Yes, some work yeah. against one another. So this immunity and this, uh, this immunoglobulin that they are trying to create, this antibody, has to cover them all. And it's got to take time and for that so, animal, right? To yeah, so it time. takes months to do that. Wow. And once the animal is immune, they pull the, the blood from the animal. They generally put the red blood cell back in and keep the white because that's the serum. That's where the antibody is. Okay. And they pull that antibody off and process it in various ways. And that's what you get injected to you in the hospital in an IV. That's the antivenom. And that, this, so that antivenom, what it's essentially doing is it's just counteracting the effects. It, it goes in and it, it, it renders those toxins in your system in harmless. Okay. And it, where they can't do their job. And, and then it allows your body to uh, eliminate them through your renal system, your liver, et cetera. Okay. There, there are some issues with certain venoms, coral snake being one. It has a presynaptic toxin, uh -oh. which means when the, uh, when the nerve sends a little impulse to the muscle to move, it travels over uh, uh, acetylcholine, a little chemical. Well, <clears throat> when that venom attaches after the message at, at, the, at the actual muscle site and the antivenom comes in, it releases it. Okay. And, and things start to normalize. Now, I'm talking about 
hundreds of thousands of cells, not, yeah. okay, well, when it attaches and binds presynaptically before, it actually kills some of that mechanism. That so the anti-venom can't fix that. Uh. Your own body has to fix that over a period of days or weeks, which could put you on a respirator. Because your diaphragm. Yeah, so the importance with coral snake in the North America, get the antivenom before that presynaptic toxin binds and you don't have a problem. You're not gonna get on a respirator, you're gonna go home. Okay. But once you're in there and you delay and that binds, that antivenom's not gonna fix that part of the venom toxin gotcha. regime. Which why may, it makes the work here so valuable because coral snakes are a shy species, they're fossorial, they're underground. Yeah. When you get bit by them, there wasn't a lot of like um, anti-venom production of that for, uh, before you really started to take an interest in it. Or is no, that we, right? we, we were working with old Wyeth that was left over from 2008 that was five and 10 years old, expired. Okay. By, by the way, anti-venom uh, does go bad. will last forever. Uh, oh. They can't give it to you past the expiration because that's an FDA, you know, if something happens, I mean, okay. it's just not that, you don't want to use old medicines, period. Okay. But it wow. does work when there's nothing else. So. Uh, the downside of all of this is uh, there was a period of time where the anti-venom was sparse. It was, uh, you know, it wasn't everywhere. And so the poison control centers were trying to figure out how to move it, where to get it. And then the guidelines were don't use the anti-venom on a coral snake bite unless you're absolutely sure and see symptoms. Well, by the time you see symptoms, it's too late. Okay. Now that anti-venom is available and Pfizer has made it available to anybody that wants to buy it in a hospital chain, the guidelines are, look, if you're sure it was a bite, use it. Don't wait for symptoms. Because the first symptoms of these guys is the bulbar paralysis up here. Okay. The eyes droop, uh, ex excessive salivation, slurring of the speech, or their tongue, you know, that's starting to p go get paralyzed. And then as the venom continues to work without being neutralized, it'll end up and paralyze your diaphragm and then you don't breathe and you, 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 die, use, you die or go on a respirator. So, okay, so let's get moving to what you're gonna do here well, today. You got the baby food. Yeah. But, and this is just so that you can control the actual nutrients going in these young neonates yeah. and raise them up so that they are healthy enough to produce enough venom for you to extract. Yeah, what we're doing is the first year of 10, we okay. took a venom sample every quarter. Okay. And that's been sent to Bill, and we're gonna look at that. Okay, on year two, from year one to two, we're taking another venom sample every quarter, but from each individual snake. Wow. So uh, these babies have to be fed about every 10 days. The adults can go uh, a couple weeks easy. And the problem with tubing is it's a stress on the esophagus. Yep. Uh, you can have esophageal tears and problems. So you gotta be real careful, you gotta be real slow, and take your time. Uh, it's hard to raise the babies up. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you can't pin them and stress them. And this was a learning project for me. I will tell you this, taking venom from babies right out of the egg for the first six months is a nightmare. I'll tell you why. They want to bite you. The yeah. adults don't. Uh, coral snakes are the most gentle. They, they don't want to be touched. They don't want to be nothing. Right. Uh, you got to really provoke them to be bitten. Okay. The babies, not so much, man. They will bite you in a heartbeat. So you got to be real careful with catching them. Uh, so I developed a way uh, with them that I'll show you now okay. that where we go in a tube and pull it out. You gotta be careful if, if they wanna come out of this tube too quick and you're not ready, you're gonna end up in a palm of your hand. Okay. But I, I'm seeing as they get older, they're at the stage now about, uh, probably about 16 months, where they're not really, uh, they're not, either they're getting used to it or they've settled down because okay. they're, they're not as, they're not as uh, crazy as they were when they were little ones. Wild. Um, all right, well, so, so what we'll do here is uh, get a little bit of water for a little lubrication. All right. Get a little bit of surgery lube here for, for a little extra lubrication. And we rinse all of this baby food off of the end of the syringe, otherwise it will blow off. And, and then instead of being bitten by a snake, you'll be spattered with baby food from... <laughs> I don't know what's worse, man. I think uh, I'll take the baby food, Jack. I, I will tell you, uh, this Gerber's number two we've used forever. I use this in the 60s. Oh, yeah? And it, 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 you can keep a... On your snake. human children? No, well, no on, no, on snakes. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, on tubing. That's yeah, amazing. And, and it's got just about all they need, but why I added stuff to my formula was I wanted to get to a 21-day schedule. In other words, I don't want to feed them for 21 days. That's okay. a long time for a coral because they got a high metabolism. So by adding other things experimentally over a couple of years, I can do that. 
And now the stress on the esophagus is less. And most of my colony has been here since 2012. Though they yeah. got remembered back in Bush Garden days. That's right. Uh, and, and they're breeding and they're doing great. So we've conquered that part. So it, if you're using just baby food, you, you, you won't, they won't grow as well. Oh, like gotcha. You got to yeah. incorporate some yeah. other You got to incorporate some nutrients. other nutrients. You know, it's kind of interesting, guys. So, you know, this is much different than some of the other uh, places we go visit because this is, in essence, a laboratory, in my, in my uh, opinion, in fact. And, um, you know, so it's just interesting to see the difference in husbandry. But the end result uh, is the same. It's the well-being of the snakes. It's the production of the snakes. And therefore, these animals in this room generally are, are existing to save human beings. It's so important. And Jack, you got your start many, many years ago. Uh, from the old Miami Serpentarium ride on yeah. the Bill Hast. And I started with Bill when I was yeah. uh, 16, got my driver's license to work Saturday and Sundays. And, so cool. Um, yeah, that, but it's a that, lifelong that, passion. It's a lifelong yeah, passion. Yeah, and it's amazing that you know you, you had, of course, another profession that you, you did, but now this, your passion, has become uh, you know from a side project to a full-time project for you. Yes. All right, yes. so we'll just let him handle the snake. And as we said, the babies can be a little bit more tricky, um, but such a beautiful snake, the coral snakes. I found multiple coral snakes in my backyard. They're shy. Most people are getting bit by this species, whether they're gardening or little children playing. They see a brightly colored snake, yeah. they grab it. And thankfully, they are mostly, uh, their temperament is very good right. because, uh, you know, they don't try and bite. And we saw earlier, uh, you did show us an adult that was a little more twitchy, and that's its body language is showing you. Yeah, well, we'll go from here careful. to two okay. different sizes. Okay, cool. Well, what I want to stress is, is um, this is really not free handling from my perspective. I don't want the snake crawl all over me, but but you can't really get it out with a hook, and I will not use tongs, and uh, we have to think of that. These snakes are fragile when they're young. Gotcha. So we had to figure out a way to do this periodically, um, and I'll be honest with you, the first couple, three months with new ones, I did have two little accidents. When you're putting the tube down their throat right out of their first two or three weeks, they're so, uh, they're so delicate. If you're holding them too tight as you push the feeding tube through, you're, you, you're, you could you're dead them. in three days because you rip the esophagus. Okay. So you try to do it with less pressure and then you give them the ability. It's, it's, a, it's a learning process. Gotcha. So I'm not doing this for any kids to do this. No, 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 okay. no. Do not uh, touch, of course, guys. You know, watching our videos, he is a professional and this is for venom extraction. Now, and for now the reason I saved uh, these four is they were exceptionally in color and pattern. Okay. Now, you see, I'm not going to restrain him much. I'm going to pull him out. And what I'm going to do is get him to go into this tube this. by himself. Yep. And he changed his mind. So we'll have to try it again. Oh, I see. You got a clear tube behind that. Clear tube behind there. Ken, would you get me a paper towel, please? Yes. All right, now we'll let him get in to the point where... All right, Look now, at now that. We, we safely have... Uh, we safely have... By the way, that's a good-looking feces. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Yeah. So you are checking the feces oh, oh, yeah, and making yeah, sure yeah, that they're go. firm, right? What do you yeah. want? Like yeah. a good, firm poop? Yeah, you want it to look like it normally looks when they're eating other snakes. Okay. <laughs> Good. By the way, that's their diet. And All right. uh, as you can see, he's, he's in good shape. All right, now what we're going to do Look at is that. we're going to get him out. So that tube is flexible enough that you can actually restrain him a little bit through it? No, it's solid. Oh, it is? No, okay, no, okay. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. You, ah. oh, now, I'll pull him out to a ah, point look where, at you. where you're ready here. Yep, yep, yep. Look at get you. Him right like that. Now, this guy is going in the shed. He's a little opaque. Yeah. All right, now they're easier to do at this age uh, than when they were juveniles, but what we'll do now is we'll put this in very slowly. Look, it's got surgery lube, a little bit of water, and then you gotta kinda, you know, just, you can't hold them tight, you just relax it. I'm gonna go down to a, a 14 uh, centimeters here, 11, 12, 13. And 14 is a good spot. That reduces regurgitation because the food coming out of the catheter is going in both directions. So now what you want to do is you want to pinch them right here to hold that off a little bit. <clears throat> their heart is right about here. If, if you feel their heart beating on your youth, that's not the good spot to, uh, to pinch them. And he will get uh, four milliliters of food. 
And if I go too fast, it'll blow off. That, that's a lot. That's a thick food to get through this uh, little little. little thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a. So you just take your a, time with it. Yeah, it's a six and a half catheter. Okay, so now he is fed, and you you, you pull it out very slowly. You don't want. You got to go slow with these old guys. They're they're tough yet delicate. Beautiful. All right, and then that will carry him for ten days. That's incredible. But what a great system you've you've really tried to minimize the risk obviously to yourself and that was just a little thing like the tube and getting him in the tube by placing it back here is it's kind of ingenious it's that's awesome how the hell did you think that up bud well everybody that does snakes knows how to tube snakes okay. yeah. i mean uh yeah uh that that's not uh not that's not anything that's uh New. Okay. Uh, that's not my my thing. That's just. Uh, I, I've just trade adapted secret. it here. Yeah. Let, let me turn this off. You got it. It's very the thing comes on, and the next thing I got TikTok playing in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, yeah. Very cool. Now we do the same thing with the, uh, the bigger uh, snakes, but of course they're fed uh, on a 60 milliliter syringe. Right. Uh, it's the same process. Uh, we capture them a little bit different because we don't have to pin them. Right. Uh, and we don't have to tube them. You can just reach down and get them if you're careful. And you look at you look at their, uh, yeah, he almost fell in the heel. Hey, hold on a second. I just wanted to, I, this is funny. He's, he's focused on us. He I'm goes backwards. Go. Yeah, and he yeah. just banged against this. <laughs> and that's, that's why it's fun having Matt around. I got to keep an eye on Matt, because one of these days, Matt, he's going to fall off a cliff into the mouth of something. Well, let's have a look now. These are the larger. Yeah, this, the larger. Uh, this guy here. Look at that. Beautiful. This is, this is a typical coloration. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Okay, now, now he is, um, he's, he, he's a year older than him, and he's, actually he's a runt. Really? He has not grown as quick as uh, his, his clutch mates. Did. Gotcha. And it's funny because these guys, again, very, very secretive snakes. Very secretive. Mostly found under leaf litter, underground. They will come out uh, after heavy rains uh, to look for any other. Right. They, they eat snakes, as you said, lizards, yeah. small invertebrates and stuff like that. But, you, you know, the other thing I noticed about you is you don't, you're very calm with the snake. Um, you know they're venomous, obviously, I'm just saying, but you know, just that moment, the snake twitched like that, but there was no real big reactions out of Jack here. Yeah, it's, just, um, um, it's just, you know, you gotta stay so, calm. Well, you get, you kind of get used to it and, and you kind of know their, their behavior pattern. Right. Uh, now, oh, that's a, that's a larger snake there. Yeah, now the, here's one that's been here since 2012. Beautiful. Snakes are like people. Now you see the size of that head and the venom yes, glands, of yes. course, the, that's what we, we want, a, a big head. But snakes are like people. They will grow, 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 and when they evidently reach their length genetically, they get fat and big and round. <laughs> okay. So, so then you gotta back off uh, okay. of, the, of the diet. But you see how he's twitching? Yeah. You see this? Come here, see, guys. Okay, now this that, behavior here. that is the, the defensive behavior you know, get away from me, uh, don't leave me alone, I just wanna go my way. Uh, That's how they talk to you, friends. Yeah. Now, obviously, the best way to learn from, from watching them is that coloration. Just leave them be. Leave them be. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't do the rhyme. Uh, yeah. You know, ba basically, I, if it's got a black nose, it's a coral, that's probably better than all the rhymes. Yes. But I will tell you the problem with that is some scarlet king snakes have a dark nose. It's not really, really red. It looks black, and then I don't want to tell people that because now they're going to start killing harmless scarlet exactly. king snakes. Exactly. We don't want you to kill any snake. Yeah. Most people get bit no. when they try to yeah. kill snakes. So just leave the snakes alone. They want nothing to do with you. But it's amazing. This section of what you're doing is so important and it's a passion of yours you don't need to be doing this it's something you've always been interested in to a degree like you know I love husbandry I love seeing the snakes in nature you've kind of gone into this more molecular biology you know what well, does the venom do what do you think yeah you know I got interested in venoms and toxinology early on and mm -hmm. that was my main interest that drove me but you got to have the husbandry and you got to know how to keep you got to have you got to know how to keep snake alive to do this right. but you know people this is something that you know sitting on a ship there looking and relaxing you start to think and you look back you know you're getting up you're reaching this 74 75 year mark and you say you know what you look back over the history and you say 
you know, why, why do you do this? You know, I'm not doing this in here in front of people. I'm doing it just because I like to do it. And then you want to say, well, is it an ego thing? And I, well, I tell myself, no, it's not. I, I've come to the realization, and this is just me talking, I'm not speaking for any other Venom producer, is it must be some kind of ego thing. Because while I look at other people and I, you know, I see people skydiving and I see people climbing mountains and I see people riding bikes yeah. like you do and yeah. driving off of cliffs and doing this stuff and coming back and landing on your wheels. And I'm thinking, you know, there's an exhilaration to that. There is. And there's an adrenaline rush. And there's an adrenaline rush to this because I realize that it's you and it's a snake. And now, okay, you can overpower them, you can grab them, you can catch them. That's all I want to do when I was younger. Then you go through this phase, hey, you know what? I want to do it so it's the easiest on the snake. And then you go through the phase, let's get them out of these small ones, let's put them in bigger ones, let's make it better. And then, but as you keep going through this, then you start grading yourself. Okay, I'm gonna do 80 corals today. How many bad misses? How many bad Where? grabs did I have? That's gotta be the indicator to tell you, is it time to step away? Uh, because, you know, while people will look at this and say it's dangerous, uh, and coral snake is one of the probably better snakes to get bitten by as far as time, because you've got more time. But, you know, I, I do other rattlesnakes, too, for geographical studies and samples. Uh, not, not like my other cohorts do. You know, they, they do a lot because uh, they have the shows to do, and they do a lot of volume. But, but it's all the basically same thing. But for me, I realize that it's, it's something you do because... It, there, your ego is involved, even though you don't think so. Yeah, no. I mean, I, you don't go brag about no, it. No, uh, listen, it's, it's, it's a strange a thing. thing. I don't know. It, it, I, I understand what you're saying because the reason I love the, these animals is because they are necess not necessarily, it's harder to see the humanity in a snake or yeah. a lizard or a crocodile or something like that, right? But by the proximity we have to work with these animals, you do see nature in a raw form. Right. And I think human beings are removed from that yeah. many times. And so, yeah. number one, you get to reconnect with some very primitive aspect of our own psyche. Right. The other thing that you, you know, when you talk about ego, I would pos posit that people that do have this adrenaline rush are necessary for the society. And I'll tell you why, like you look at guys that did extreme sports, right. snakes, yeah. these, these are the, you know, I would say that the Vikings and the early explorers were of the same mentality yeah. and they help push knowledge forward. Right. You know, it's the leader of the tribe that went a little bit further and figured things out that brought the whole tribe yeah. and they benefited from that. Some of them died, right? but some of them, you know, the ones that go forward, yeah. they really push society and humankind yeah. forward. And for me, the knowledge, I think you have this thirst for knowledge and the knowledge that you have been able to impart on myself, on the people out there, and then by and large what you're doing with Venom Production, if we didn't have Ego. I wouldn't say it's ego. I think it's. I think you would have been a great BMX rider, buddy, because well, you would be doing flips with me. But it's the same reason I, I don't want to do flips and get hurt anymore. I want to. I want to be adventurous with my mind. Right. But you still are getting that same. It's like dopamine dump. Well, you know? I loved bull riding when I was. I followed the bull riding get circuit. Get Man, you know, and my 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 my, so my, my son's a rancher and he's in all that. And, but it's I like. That is that same, here's what's different. I am very fortunate. There's only a handful of venom producers in the United States, probably, probably less than six or seven that are really doing it. And so I'm fortunate to be one of those that, that actually what I'm doing is helping people. Right. But that's not something you can pick and choose and say I'm going to do it because that's, it's hard to get to that point. And that just happens because of being in it a long time and, and landing a venom, and a venom contract or something like that. And so that part of it makes it even better. That's the icing on a cake yeah. for this. Yeah. Uh, that's the rewarding part. I get it. It's, um, it's incredible. You know, I mean, we could actually, I mean, it's, it's, this is why I love coming here because you, when you and I talk, we talk about, you know, it's not just our love of reptiles. There's a whole other aspect of why we do this, what makes us who we are. Yeah. Uh, we're not just a one trick pony, so to speak, yeah. the way we think. And I think there's a lot of people out there that get something valuable by seeing someone who is in their 70s, still passionate, yeah. still has that little twinge, uh, that <laughs> mischievousness and uh, mischievousness, I believe is the proper way of saying it. But I mean, we could do a whole episode on 
on oh, yeah. our psychological profile. You but he's getting it. tired holding that. Well, go ahead. What were you going right. to say? One more thing. Sure. You know, as you get older, you know, like my, my hearing's gone, so I don't hear the rattlesnakes rattle. And there are certain things that you miss. And, right. and, uh, and as you get older, you're, you know, my wrists don't work anymore. They're, so I can't do big diamond backs. Uh, I know my limitations. Yeah, and, smart. and, you know, so the smaller snakes, the delicate stuff, you, you still got to have some feeling in, in the fingers to feel like the feel and everything. Uh, otherwise, your snake's going to die. But uh, let's end the coral snake thing with one big one. And, okay. And by the way, um, if anybody out there knows of this, I'm looking for some kind of camera uh, software where I can take a picture of a snake and get an accurate measurement. I want to try to get this coral snake recorded because okay. the best I can find is 47 and a half inches recorded. I know there's been over 50, I've heard 60, but nobody's recorded them. And this girl came in in 2012 with a weed eater injury and she is, I think, right at the 49 inch. I can get 48 measuring with just me without stretching her. Okay. But I've been told there's software where you can take a picture and it will measure every pixel right down wow so uh and that's what i've been told i got to do and then i can get it recorded and while accurate. she's still alive okay once she dies i can take her up to university of florida and they'll do that but, but it's important for you you want to know if you got one of the largest yeah, coral snakes. Uh, let's see her and this is cool this, this is a prime example uh, of one that's still growing because she was 41 inches when she got here in 2012. wow and now so she's 11 years 48 plus and we'll just bring her out very gently, very gently by the tail. I'm going to bring her towards you, Ken, okay. and put her out here so you can see the size of yeah, her she's head. beautiful. And you can see where that injury was. Yeah. Okay, she's a little... The injury... It's upper... Yeah, right there. right here. Yeah, it's towards the front. Wow, she's beautiful, though. But, boy, you see the size of that head? <laughs> that head is uh, yeah, massive. Yeah, that, that head is massive. Wow. That is so, some snake. Now, so again, we'll put her back. Yeah, go ahead. She's looking a little, let's not risk it. But that's a, uh, well done, man. That's a beautiful snake. So yeah, if you guys know, leave in the comments below. And we got to get that software to my friend Jack so we can find uh, accurate measurements. So that's a large snake. And then, you know, aside from that, you are also a fan of some of the rattlesnakes. We have Helioderma here. We got Gila monsters. Yeah, we, we got uh, six mm -hmm. Gila's. Um, some of these I've caught myself and kept. Okay. Um, and then all of these samples were sent off for geographical documentation. And gotcha. That. Uh, these were born here two years ago. That's an albino wow, eastern and that's a that. head eastern. Eastern diamondback. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. You know, listen, I love coming here and, and hanging out with you because, number one, whenever I come in this room, uh, it's it's gorgeous. It's well, just, there's thank an you. attention to detail. The animals are in top-notch condition. Um, and I, I feel, you know, here's the thing. So many times we visit keepers um, and things are just a little bit kind of like, I like cowboy hats, I don't wanna be a cowboy. Do you yeah, understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. When I come here, I really get a great sense of the attention and care and, you know, just the, um, the way you go about everything is, is so calming to me. It's almost like being with a, a Shaolin monk. And wow. your martial arts <laughs> is venomous snakes, which yeah. is really kind of cool. When you were describing what you do, it's almost you're on a master's journey, you know what I mean? Like you're on this journey, like when you say, I grade myself. And, you know, I've realized also the other great thing that you just said that I want to reiterate is when you realize that, hey, listen, I can no longer work with the big snakes. I'm risking too much. Um, but you adapt, you change. Yeah. The same way I'm not doing flips on bikes anymore, I'm pushing myself in a different way, right, but right. I still get the same adrenaline rush yeah. and conquering and, and reaching goals. And at the end result, what you're doing and what's so important to impress upon people out here, maybe there's a uh, young Jack Facente out there watching, is you're providing a service for people because without, like I said, without the people that are on the harbinger, that are the harbingers really, uh, on the forefront uh, that most mainstream people think is crazy, without guys like you, people are gonna suffer and animals will suffer as well. Would this be a good time to bring up that pyramid picture? I would love to see it. Check this out. So Jack's uh -huh. always thinking, like I said, he's not a one trick pony. He's thinking of ways to show the value of what uh, agrotoxins and others like himself are doing. Yeah, so you came up with this pyramid to kind of show the value of what private keepers and private labs like yourself are doing uh, for society. 
Yeah, and I want to take this opportunity to thank all the private keepers and the private labs and uh, and all the breeders and the commercial folks out there, uh, you know, in the private sector and commercial sector. What I tried to enlighten the powers to be before they make these rules. Is, at FWC, at Florida Fish and at, at FWC, yeah. that's, that's, our, that's our guidelines, that's our rule maker, uh, our law, is the basis of this pyramid or the keepers and the breeders. This pyramid is all designed to help the general public. And as you come up, you know, you've got the Venom Labs. There's only three in Central Florida, right. Jim and Kristen in Kentucky, Nate Nate up in uh, Wisconsin, um, and Elda Sanchez has a lab too in Kingsville, Texas. Um, the, the, you know, Carl and George here in Central Florida with me. And those are the ones that do, uh, you know, all the time. Right. Well, they are supported by this bottom tier. And then the work we do as we send our product up the line, it's not just for antivenom and snake bite. If you're hunting, you're hiking, or you're fishing, it's for medical research. Right. And it also, by making these laws and taking away that bottom factor, now you're not only taking away that medical research, the, the needs that they need this, you're taking away all the opportunity of young kids coming up through the ranks of snake. I, I, hey, I would. I'm more medically inclined than I ever was, and I'm a snake guy, and I right. know toxinologists, I know people in the poison control center, I know researchers that all came up as snake people, and that was their, that's what pushed them up into this field. Now, they support, uh, you know, the, the tier here. Right. The university research, your co I mean, we got the best university here in FSU, they got a great lab. UCF ha had a good one here, but they moved to South Carolina, I think. There's schools that are great, and, and th they do all the, the research on this stuff. They catalog the venoms. They look for different things. Uh, the private research companies and, and the independent medical research, they all fuel the pharmaceutical antivenom, the drug manufacturers, the new cures for cancers, for pain, for right. cardiac, drugs made from venom. There's tons of this stuff. Uh, treating snake bites and all of that, you know who the benefactor is? The general public. Right. So if you're going to get rid of the three to 500 people in Florida that are licensed, that you know about, that you monitor, that's your right hand, that can help you, you're going to, you're going to create a black market entity just right. like they did with the indigo. The indigos aren't worth $2,000 a piece anymore. They're not regulated like that. So all I'm saying is the rules have unintended consequences. And when you take away, if you take away one or two things in the middle, it'll, it'll survive. Fall. You take away this, the, and that's that's what I'm trying to explain and ask for them. Just look at it. Gotcha. You know, unintended consequences. So we'll see where it goes. We'll see where it goes. Well, he sent this off to Florida Fish and Wildlife Commissioners out there in Tallahassee, and I hope that they uh, will take the three minutes it takes to read this, because as we all in this community know, people like Jack are an invaluable part of our education and our love of these animals. And that's why I like to get up here and see what you're doing. I love it. And well, I you. really appreciate you, man. Like when I, when you <laughs> returned my call, cause he was on a cruise, I it went straight to voicemail. I was like, ah, crap, I'm gonna be in his area. I'm gonna miss Jack. But he called me late last night. Uh, well, yesterday, today is the day after Easter, but uh, he, yeah. he took time away from family to ring us up. So say thanks to Jack well, for all he does. Thank you for all you do. You're, uh, you, the masses kind. you reach and your educational platform and your quality of your videos, this is what I love. There's oh, I no, appreciate it. It's not hype. It's not. It, it's good, solid stuff. We're just trying to do the right yeah. thing. I'm trying to be like Jack when I grow up. <laughs> all right, everybody. All right. And Jack's still growing up. So uh, we'll see you again. Let me know what you thought of today's video, what you think of Jack's work. Leave a comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And please uh, be good to snakes because they're more valuable than some of you may think. See ya.